from 1820 on, Joseph Smith was steadily attacked in a pattern of accusations followed by eventual vindications. The pattern continues. Justice prophesied, fools deride him. Hell rages against him, and his name is both good and evil spoken of. The swirl needlessly preoccupies a few who seem to prefer chewing on old bones in the outer courtyard instead of coming inside to the resplendent revelatory banquet, thus diverting them from giving due attention to Joseph's mission as a choice seer. Reassuring prophecies further declare that Joseph's enemies shall be confounded and reassure us that the prophet's people will not be turned against him by the testimony of traitors. Ironically, young Joseph went into the grove merely wanting to know which church to join, not seeking to be called as a seer, revelator, and translator and prophet. In the grove and subsequently there came sunbursts of serendipity. The resulting revelations and translations were not mere speculations, thoughts for the day, or even epigrams, but instead they were divine declarative disclosures. The volume of resulting revelations and translations is enormous, underscoring the words choice seer. Yet, even though God wants to give us all that he hath, we suffer from a poverty of perceptions. Little wonder that Paul commended Abraham, who, quote, staggered not in disbelief, end of quote. There's a risk when we contemplate the doctrines of the restoration that we might stagger in the face of such bold and promising truths. Given such breathtaking revelations and translations, let us therefore heed King Benjamin's counsel. Quote, believe in God. Believe that man doth not comprehend all the things that God comprehends. End quote. Alas, in a secular world, Jesus is regarded by many at best as a distant figure. He is even denigrated. How transcendingly special, therefore, that the revelations of the Restoration confirm this cosmic fact. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus, who performed the infinite atonement, thereby suffered infinitely and is a fully comprehending Savior, having descended below all things and comprehending all things. Yes, as in the lyrics of the moving spiritual of yesteryear, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Notably, at the last day, the adversary will not support those who followed him anyway. He cannot. Jesus will triumph majestically, and the adversary's clever constructs, pleasing to the carnal mind, will also collapse, and the fall thereof will be exceedingly great. Brothers and sisters, we dare not hold back the restored gospel's declaratives. We dare not hold back the reassuring revelations and truth-telling translations about things as they really are and things as they really will be. These are so needed by those whose weary hands hang down because they suffer from doctrinal anemia which can best be treated by the red blood cells of the Restoration. Meanwhile, let us expect that many will regard us indifferently. 
others will see us as quaint or misled. Let us bear the pointing fingers too, which ironically belong to those being bored who finally find the great and spacious building to be a stale and cramped third-class hotel. Let us revile not the revilers and heed them not. Instead, let us use our energy to hold up the shield of faith to quench the incoming fiery darts, aided perhaps by a touch of spiritual Teflon. Brothers and sisters, given all of the foregoing, what can I say more except praise to the man who communed with Jehovah in the name of Jesus Christ? Amen.